Well, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you all for coming. I'm John Levy. I'm privileged to serve as the 10th chair of the Board of Directors of the Legal Services Corporation. Thank you for attending this significant briefing on the importance of legal aid programs to disaster preparedness and recovery. I particularly want to thank Texas distinguished Senator John Cornyn for his help in making this event possible and for his longstanding support of LSC. And I could not be here in the Senate without expressing our profound gratitude to Mississippi's retiring Senator Thad Cochran. He has been a champion of LSC throughout his long and illustrious career, and we wish him the very best in his retirement. I also want to thank the remarkable members of our panel. We'll be introduced shortly by our moderator, LSC's outstanding and longest serving president, Jim Sandman. Well, survivors of hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, and other disasters can face a host of legal challenges. Replacing identification papers, applying for disaster benefits, dealing with insurance claims, preventing unlawful evictions and foreclosures, and combating contractor scams. LSC has expertise in working with a network of national and local partners to help legal aid programs serve low-income clients facing these and other challenges in the wake of a disaster. Through a coordinated national infrastructure, LSC grantees provide access to resources and information vital for communities to respond to disasters and emergencies. And so today, I'm happy to formally announce a new LSC initiative to improve disaster preparation and response, the Legal Service Corporation's Disaster Task Force. This national task force will work with business and emergency management communities to increase awareness of civil legal aid, disaster preparedness, and response. It will also engage these communities to partner with LSC grantees to develop a systematic approach to preparing for and responding to the legal needs of low-income Americans who have experienced a disaster. At its conclusion, the task force will produce a toolkit and create best practices and recommendations to help grantees improve the effectiveness and timeliness of their disaster preparation and response. We're so for very fortunate that the co-chairs of this task force will be former Chief Judge of New York's Court of Appeals, the extraordinary Jonathan Lippman. Jonathan's here today, please. He's now of counsel to Latham and Watkins, LSC's terrific vice chair and immediate past dean and Harvard Law Professor Martha Minow will also co-chair it together with our outstanding LSC board member, Father Pius Petrie. We are also very grateful that the Latham and Watkins firm has generously agreed to support and underwrite the work of this task force. The more than 30 members of the task force will include LSC grantees, members of LSC's Leaders Council, emergency management experts, other stakeholders, including two tremendous members of today's panel, Texas Chief Justice Nathan Hecht, Florida's Chief Justice George Labarga. In establishing this task force, I'm reminded of the very powerful talk that Justice Scalia gave at LSE's 40th anniversary just a few years ago. And in speaking of LSE, he observed that LSE, quote, pursues the most fundamental of American ideals, and it pursues equal justice in those areas of life most important for the lives of our citizens, unquote. Well, I can't think of anything more important in the lives of our citizens than helping them to get back on their feet when they have been victims of a disaster. And that brings us to today's discussion. And let me introduce its moderator, Jim Sandman, 
<laughs> former managing partner of the law firm of Arnold and Porter, who served as the general counsel for the District of Columbia Public Schools before joining LSC in 2011. He's been president of LSC for the past seven years, and how lucky for all of us that he took our call and accepted our invitation to join LSC. Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Sandman. I'm president of the Legal Services Corporation. I'd like to start by introducing our distinguished panel. To my far right is Chief Justice Nathan Hecht of the Texas Supreme Court. Chief Justice Hecht has been the chief since 2014. He is the longest serving justice on the, in the history of the Texas Supreme Court. He served on that court since 1988. Prior to joining the Texas Supreme Court, he was a judge on the Intermediate Appellate Court in Texas, and prior to that, served as a trial judge in Texas. He's a professional judge. Uh, to my uh, near right is Sandra Brown, who is directing, directing attorney of Disaster Legal Services at Lone Star Legal Aid, which is based in Houston, Texas, and serves uh, Southeast Texas. Uh, Sandra has extensive experience in the provision of legal aid service to people who have been affected by disasters. To my immediate left is Chief Justice George LaBarga of the Florida Supreme Court. Chief Justice LaBarga has been chief since 2014. He, uh, prior to that, served on the Intermediate Appellate Court in Florida, and before that was a trial uh, judge in Florida. Both Chief Justice Hecht and Chief Justice LaBarga are champions of access to justice for people who cannot afford to pay for counsel. To my far left is Monica viguez Bitan, who is Executive Director of the Legal Services of Greater Miami, uh, which, includes, which serves Miami and Dade counties, and also Monroe County, which is where the Florida Keys are located. Uh, as you can see, our panel has some experience in areas that are regularly affected by disasters of one kind or another. Let me uh, give you just a quick overview of what the Legal Services Corporation is and what legal aid is. The Legal Services Corporation is the country's single largest funder of civil legal aid for low-income Americans. We were created by an act of Congress in 1974 and get virtually all of our money from an annual congressional appropriation. We're a grant-making organization. We fund 133 independent legal aid programs with more than 800 offices that among them serve every county in every state, the territories, and the District of Columbia. No matter where you are in the United States, there's an LSC-funded legal aid program providing legal assistance to low-income people. What is legal aid? Legal aid is assistance to people who cannot afford to pay for a lawyer in a civil case. Most Americans don't realize that you have no right to a lawyer in a civil case. Civil cases include evictions, foreclosures, family law matters. They include uh, consumer cases. Uh, when a victim of domestic violence is seeking a protection order, that's a civil case. As a general matter, you have no right to a government-provided lawyer in those circumstances. You have to depend on a legal aid organization or on the assistance of a volunteer pro bono lawyer. Legal aid plays a critical role in helping low-income people after a disaster because, you'll, as you'll hear from our panel and as John mentioned in his introduction, there are a lot of legal issues that may not be obvious to you that arise after a disaster hits. So I'd like to start by asking uh, Chief Justice Hecht, uh, who has seen a lot in, in Texas and his uh, experience on various courts there, what your perspective is, uh, Chief Justice, uh, of the importance of civil legal aid after a disaster, uh, what your perspective is on how disasters affect the operations of the court system and the particular impact that disasters have on low-income people who can't afford to pay for counsel. Thank you, Jim. Um, pleasure to be here today, and I'll add my thanks uh, to John's, to um, Senator Cornyn for uh, sponsoring us here today and for his support over the uh, many years of uh, access to justice, and also Senator Shelby, uh, chairman of the CJS uh, subcommittee, uh, who uh, looks at uh, uh, LSC's appropriation, and Senator Shelby's been a great friend and supporter as well. Um, let me just set the stage uh, for you for just a second. Uh, 
something like Harvey hits like a ton of bricks. And you know it's coming maybe a couple of days early. You're thinking about it, uh, what you're going to do. But, you know, it's like preparing for the sky to fall. It's just there's no real way to do it. Sometimes people leave. This time um, in Houston, the problem was water, <clears throat> not so much storm. Uh, they got um, uh, uh, five feet of water in two days, 60 inches, um, and uh, it uh, just brings things to a halt. The courts, uh, judges, uh, court staff can't get to the courts buildings. Uh, in Houston, one of the buildings flooded uh, the criminal courts building, so the uh, criminal courts had no place to sit at all and had to move over into the civil courts building, doubling up. Um, the family courts were operational, uh, and the juvenile courts, which is very important in a, in a time like that because um, uh, domestic problems don't stop, uh, problems <coughs> uh, with uh, uh, child abuse don't stop, uh, and there need to be access to judges that can help with those kinds of problems, just like there always are. Um, so the, uh, it's a very sudden and dramatic um, uh, event, and people are scrambling. Um, then uh, this hits uh, lower income people especially hard. Uh, they're on the edge, typically. Um, they are making it uh, day by day, month by month. Uh, they don't have any savings. Uh, they don't have uh, anything for emergencies. Uh, and um, they're just basically, usually, typically, uh, hoping for the best. So something like the storm in Houston um, destroyed uh, hundreds, thousands of apartments, um, uh, making it uh, uh, difficult for all of those uh, people who were living there to find uh, alternate space to live. Some of them had to move out of Houston. Um, and uh, it makes it very difficult for them to get to court. Uh, the problems uh, go on and on for uh, days and weeks. Uh, and it's just um, absolutely critical to getting the community back on its feet um, for there to be uh, legal services for people who have not, didn't think they were gonna need services like this, but now are faced with uh, the, probably the worst disaster in their life. Um, and um, uh, so it was a very uh, encouraging uh, to us in Texas that lawyers called from across the country and said they would be happy to uh, help out. Many did. Um, we set up ways for them to do that uh, so that they could uh, be uh, temporary members of the Texas Bar as long as they were doing uh, legal aid work. Uh, some, uh, some of our friends in New York uh, volunteered for that. Uh, and, uh, but, but from around the country. Uh, and, uh, and the reason that they did was to help with this uh, just um, human disaster uh, that, had, uh, that had struck Houston so hard. So it was very important uh, uh, to have uh, legal aid providers um, there. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about this directly. The Lone Star Legal Aid Office in downtown Houston um, burned. Uh, which is not supposed to happen in the middle of a flood, uh, but the fire started an electrical, I mean the flood started an electrical fire and caused the building to burn. So it, there were lots of challenges to um, uh, deploying people, uh, lawyers, to help uh, with the need that was there. Uh, Chief Justice, can you say a little more about uh, what your court has done to make it easier for volunteer pro bono lawyers to supplement the limited resources of legal aid programs uh, you, you've got a program that's intended to facilitate the provision of legal services from people by lawyers who are not members of the Texas Bar but who want to help. Yes, and uh, uh, the court entered a series of orders. We, uh, not uh, as it pertains to this so much, but we suspended the statute of limitations in cases because people couldn't get to the courthouse to file things. They couldn't even get to their computers uh, to file things. Um, and took an, we let courts sit out of their uh, uh, out of their districts, out of their counties, uh, and did a number of things like that. But we also had an order that would allow a lawyer from out of state to practice law in Texas, um, uh, either physically uh, by being there or uh, over the internet. Um, and um, we had a number of those people who uh, uh, who stood to the call and really helped us with that. Okay. Thank you. 
Sandra, can you give us a brief overview of how Hurricane Harvey affected the clients that Lone Star Legal Aid serves and how it affected Lone Star Legal Aid itself? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so my name is Sandra Brown. I'm the Director of Legal Services at Lone Star Legal Aid, and we cover the eastern third of the state of Texas. So after the big flood event in Houston happened between Saturday and Sunday, Monday, unfortunately, as was mentioned, our building caught fire. Um, but the disaster recovery centers were opening on Tuesday. So there were two urgent, immediate legal needs that showed up. One, people needed to know about FEMA, and they would quickly be needing help with negotiating with or appealing with FEMA. And secondarily, their housing was an immediate, urgent situation. So the flood itself led to um, people needing help with breaking their leases, demanding repairs. So legal aid uh, immediately met the need, even though our building had blown up on Monday and had a lovely fire. Um, we were able to, uh, the flyers were kept in preparation and were in an area that had not been damaged. And we never would have expected this. We're in a concrete building. We, this was unforeseeable. But yet, we were out at the disaster recovery centers with Baker and Botts, Latham and Watkins, our pro bono partners, were all there with us, meeting the need of people at the shelters, which then became the disaster recovery centers from the second day after this. So we were there, we've been there. It was a very holistic response. We had law students that I had trained in advance and right after. I did training for our pro bono attorneys about these new issues with FEMA and briefly the landlord tenant and flood insurance. So the need was immediate and great, and I'm proud to say we were there to meet it. So how do you get the word out to the population you're trying to serve about the availability of, of legal aid? You mentioned that you have a physical presence at disaster recovery centers, but what about the people who don't find their way to a disaster recovery center? You mentioned you have flyers ready to go. I would imagine that communication is critically important if you're going to let people know uh, about your availability and what you can do to assist them? Well, we were very fortunate and are always very fortunate with our community partners. So we have flyers, which are very low tech, and they're kept in advance, and they're in the three languages of our low-income population, English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, always in our area. But we're very connected with the other nonprofits. And I myself had been the chair two years ago of the local Greater Houston Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. There's a national VOAD, state VOADs, and local. I've been the chair of our local. I've also been on all of the long-term recovery committees in Greater Houston since Hurricane Ike back in 2008. So when I have flyers, I contact United Way, who will then virtually send them to every organization connected with United Way. And I do the same thing with the VOAD and the Long-Term Recovery Committee. And that's one way of making sure that these low-tech items are put out in a higher-tech way. Additionally, because of the magnitude of Harvey, I received a lot of press requests, and I was able to speak um, to give newspaper magazine interviews, to speak on the radio. And I strategically use these as an early legal aid to prevent the need for more legal aid. I made sure that I used the early press that we were given to encourage people to apply for FEMA, to apply for the SBA, the Small Business Administration disaster loans, which many people don't understand how important they are in the disaster recovery process. Additionally, it's very hard to address um, contractor fraud issues. They're very prevalent. So I used the press we received as a preventative measure for legal aid, and I made sure I got that out. And one new thing that we got is iHeartRadio asked me to do a radio interview and then asked me to do a Facebook Live um, interview all about the landlord-tenant and the importance of applying for FEMA and the SBA. And it got early on, over 7,000, and then the director of iHeartRadio broadcast it to the entire Texas Gulf Coast. This is wonderful. It, it was a wonderful strategic way to help the client population that I was never going to see. And then the, also more people then knew about civil legal aid 
that Lone Star was there to help people struggling to make ends meet who got an extra whammy with Harvey. So you've mentioned a number of uh, different types of cases that arise after a disaster. You've mentioned the need to apply for FEMA benefits and to appeal if benefits are de denied. You've mentioned housing issues, uh, perhaps the need to get out of a lease for a property that's been severely damaged, where you may have a legal obligation uh, absent some court intervention to continue to pay rent even though the property is no longer occupiable. Uh, you've mentioned um, contractor scams. Uh, uh, can you give uh, additional examples and say something about the time frame over which these issues arise? I think most people probably believe that these are short-term issues uh, when in fact they unfold over a, a lengthy period. Yes, sir. Um they, there's sort of a, a common language that takes 10 years to recover from a disaster. The legal needs follow along with that same recovery period, and I have already heard 15 years being mentioned in connection with Harvey, but I can give you one concrete example of uh, the long-term legal needs that people might not always realize they go on for so long. Uh, we had a subgrant with the General Land Office in Texas at Lone Star Legal Aid that I oversaw to do title clearing for people who were gonna be able to um, exchange their houses for a higher opportunity neighborhood. It's called the HOP program. So they would be able to give their house to the local governmental agency that ran the community development block grant, and then instead would be able to get a stipend to buy a house in a better neighborhood. It's a wonderful way for them to have better opportunities. They needed title clearing. We were the subgrantee for Texas's general land office. I closed that project February of 2017 for Ike. I need to remind you that Ike was in 2008. So these legal needs change over time, and of course they're more urgent and immediate in the early days, but they don't go away. Um, people continue to live in unrepaired apartments and can come to us for years for that, um, that they've been suffering and want recourse for that. Uh, the, the needs for title clearing, the needs for... Um, Can you explain something about the um, title clearing, why that is so important, why you need to be able to establish title to your uh, property and, and uh, the difficulty in doing that? Yes, sir. Um, there's two reasons this comes up. First and foremost is with FEMA and FEMA's definitions of who is the owner. Many people across the Texas Gulf Coast and the other coastal states specifically ha are living in what is often referred to as heir property. It means it might have belonged to their parent or grandparent and formal title had never been transferred. You need to do some kind of process, either a probate or in Texas we have a streamlined provision with an affidavit that gives the public the world notice. So that would be important for them to be able to get loans, to access FEMA benefits, to access the next wave of programs, which could be in Houston, we've got a Harvey Fund. So some people are being repaired with that. They need to have complete ownership of their property. Under the Community Development Block Grants, which we hope will come online um, soon to help these survivors, uh, depending on the program, they'll either have to be able to show an ownership interest or ownership. So that's why it's so important, and it's also a preventative measure, since we know these disasters seem to be coming often. We are making a concerted effort to always remind clients that come to us that cleaning the title to your property might be a preventative measure to help you streamline things in the future. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Chief Justice Labarga, could you give us your perspective uh, from Florida, uh, both uh, generally, what your sense is of the importance of legal aid following a disaster, and what happened after Irma? First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I always enjoy coming. I think we've done this before. Uh, let me ask this question. How many of you have been through a hurricane? Raise your hand. So you, you felt the, uh, the power. And a lot of the damages, uh, we, people who have not been through a hurricane think of it as wind. Well, water is the major problem with hurricane, the surges and the flooding, and hence Houston. Uh, in Florida, of course, we have water everywhere, and we live in a peninsula. 
And if you happen to find yourself living at the bottom of the peninsula, you really have nowhere to go. You could get on the turnpike and be there for three or four days going one mile an hour and hope that a hurricane doesn't catch you there. Uh, but there's really no, you can't mobilize this many people. It's even worse uh, when dealing with the Florida Keys. You're talking a two-lane road, pretty much, uh, going over water, uh, and uh, it's just almost impossible. Uh, one, one example, uh, the Monroe County, which is Key West, uh, had 495 prisoners in their county jail. They, at the time, <coughs> it was thought that the Hurricane Irma was going to go through Key West itself. And so the sheriff's office in, in Monroe County, in, in combination with the sheriff's office in Palm Beach County, where I live, uh, basically transported 490-something prisoners from Monroe County, from the Monroe County Jail, all the way out to Palm Beach. Now imagine all these buses with prisoners strapped to the seats. Uh, I don't know how many going, stop and go traffic from Key West all the way to West Palm, which is a very long way. So that was accomplished and then sent back again once the emergency was over. Uh, 2.6 million Floridians uh, applied for FEMA uh, benefits after Irma struck. And many of those were either taking longer than it should have to process the claims or were de denied. And that's what lawyers came in. Uh, after uh, Katrina occurred in, in uh, New Orleans, of course, uh, the Florida Bar uh, decided to establish a fund, a voluntary fund, where lawyers, when they pay their, their fees, annual fees to be a member of the Florida Bar, they could check a box and pay additional money towards building up this benefit or this emergency fund. We, uh, by the time Irma hit, uh, there was about $707,000 in that fund, which the Florida Bar pretty much gave to the Florida Bar Foundation, which in turn uh, dedicated a lot of that money to the Naples area, West Florida, where Irma eventually came in. Now, initially, Irma, as you may have seen, was, was uh, projected to come in through Miami at 185 miles an hour, some people were saying that it was going to go up to 200 miles an hour. It stayed a Category 5 hurricane for 17 days, I believe. It has a record for the longest uh, Category 5 standing. Fortunately, that happened over water. Had it gone in through Miami at 185 miles an hour and taken I-95 north up the peninsula the way it was projected, we'd be talking like Puerto Rico. In, in, in Florida right now. Uh, it would have been devastating. You're talking Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, uh, and then up north, Orlando. And then it was so wide, it covered the entire peninsula. It would have hit Tampa, Jacksonville. By the time it made it up there, obviously, it would have weakened somewhat. But nevertheless, it would have been a major, major storm, major catastrophe. Andrew, as bad as Andrew was, it was a very compact storm. And my, my in-laws lived in South Miami at the time, and they did pretty well. They only lost a roof. Uh, but people south, uh, homestead in that area, uh, it was devastating. So hurricanes are a strange creature, and they have tornadoes embedded in them, and, uh, and that cause even, obviously, worse damage. So those are the things we were worried about. I was, I was up in Tallahassee at the Supreme Court, North Florida, uh, when Irma hit, my father, who's 99, and my mom, who's 88, uh, they were down in West Palm Beach where they live. And imagine my conversation with them, trying to get them to come to Tallahassee. I'll go get you. I'll drive all night long. I'll bring you back. And my typical father, you know, uh, I, I withstood the 1928 <laughs> hurricane in Cuba. And that was a Category 15 hurricane, <laughs> not this wimpy Category 5 things we get here. Uh, so uh, we obviously, my wife and I are sweating bullets up in Tallahassee while this hurricane, unfortunately, took a turn and it hit someone else. As far as the keys are concerned, uh, it hit the middle keys and it hit them hard. They, they got it first. And uh, I know one judge, a county judge down in, 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 in the middle keys, where she lost her house 
when she did not lose her sailboat that was docked right behind her house. So go figure. Uh, so she's living, she was living in the sailboat and holding court uh, at the same time after the, after the hurricane. So those are the things. Uh, living in Florida, it, it, I know June 1 is coming around the corner, and I'm dreading it already. And it seems to me like we're going through a period in our world where we're going to be seeing a lot more of these monster hurricanes. If you read history back in the 30s and the 40s, there were huge hurricanes. The 1928 uh, hurricane, the 1935 Labor Day hurricane that came in right through the Middle Keys, right about where Irma came in, uh, it killed everybody. And that one, that one uh, was slated to, uh, it was projected to have had 200 mile an hour winds. Uh, they, I was just mentioning someone, there's a book called uh, Last Train to Paradise. It's a, train, it's a book about the, uh, the construction of the overseas railroad by Flagler back in, that was completed in, in actually 1910. Uh, it, it explains the whole thing and then it has a bunch of chapters about the 1935 hurricane because the, the road was being constructed to the Keys at the time and they were using people who were war veterans from World War I, they were living like in shanty houses building this road, and they got caught wide open. Back in those days, you knew it was coming when it was there. There was no television or anything. So, uh, interesting book to read. It's a paperback, you can read it. I don't know the author, so I'm not making any money on this. I'm just <laughs> telling you that's one, one thing that we find interesting. But the things that you find initially, uh, housing problems, uh, people lose their homes. I mean, if you, if you are in a, in a wood uh, frame home and you get hit with a Cat 4 or a Cat 5, there's a good chance you're not going to have a house. It's just that the, the force is just so much. Uh, and, uh, and, and then where do you go? Obviously, the Salvation Army, you know, the, you know, people have things, but that can only last so long. FEMA claims, they get inundated. FEMA, everybody in FEMA gets sent down to the disaster area, and they're trying to get those forms done as quickly as possible. And some of them get rejected out of just don't have enough time to look at it type of thing. We need lawyers for that. Uh, insurance claims. Uh, most insurance companies, they'll come, obviously if they come to your house and you have no house left, the adjuster, if he or she is smart, is gonna write a, a, a check for the uh, policy limits. I mean, what else can you say? So that's not a problem. It's the other people who have structure damages to their houses that are not necessarily visible. The, the water coming in, uh, the, the mold that's going to make you and your children sick, uh, those things that somehow fall at the bottom end of the priority list when you've got so much other damage. Nevertheless, people have to live there. Uh, you know, things like we were talking about it earlier, wills, probate matters. Uh, all of a sudden, that becomes a major issue with these homes. Uh, healthcare proxies, emergency housing, uh, contractor litigation. Uh, I was down in West Palm when we had two hurricanes back to back. They, bo they both came back to a category two, uh, but it was still caused a lot of damage. After the hurricanes went away, we got all these people from out of state knocking on your doors, hey, we'll cut those three downs for you, we'll fix that roof for you, we'll do this for you, and you pay them a deposit and you never saw them again. Uh, a lot of people uh, had that problem. Uh, all those things come up. So those are the things that I think the legal system has to deal with, and, and legal aid is basically at the forefront of that. And lawyers in Florida, I'm telling you, donated uh, thousands upon thousands of pro bono hours during this time of need. Uh, and it was very, very, very helpful. Uh, the Florida Bar Foundation, which the Legal Services Corporation gladly funds, uh, provides a lot of money to these legal aid societies so they can provide legal services to people. So funding the Legal Services Corporation is crucial at, at the time when these catastrophes, these disasters hit, and they hit good, hardworking people who are just looking to get back on track again. It's absolutely vital that the legal services corporations be funded properly. And I believe that's all I can say at this moment. Thank you, Chief Justice LaVarga. Monica, can you uh, give us a brief overview of Irma and how it affected your part of Florida, Miami-Dade uh, counties, and, um, and Monroe County, the, uh, the Keys? 
course. Of course, yes. So um, Hurricane Irma for the Florida Keys was, I mean, as it's been well documented, was absolutely devastating. So as, as Chief Justice mentioned, the Florida Keys to go in and out, it's basically a two, it is a two lane highway. And uh, there is not, because they're all small islands, there's not a lot of land. And so the housing becomes, affordable housing is obviously tough to find in the Florida Keys. And so our clients that are all low income individuals tend to live in mobile home parks because that is the only form of affordable housing in the Florida Keys. And so you can imagine, thankfully, everybody, all of the clients that we've seen evacuated for the storm itself. And as it was also well documented in the news, it took days to even let residents back in so that the roads, to make sure that they were passable. And when they went back in, they came back to destruction, complete destruction in a lot of cases. Um, and so the issue for, the, for, the, for Monroe County or the Florida Keys clients really was first and foremost assistance with FEMA. And the way that our, our office handled it is that we took the perspective, and I know Sandra's program as well, is if you could avoid the legal case, all the better. And that means getting information out quickly. And so we collaborated with, you know, every elected officials, uh, local elected officials were extremely helpful because uh, their constituents tend to go to their offices instinctually when there's a problem. And so we reached out to them. Um, and our approach there was get information out quickly. And I think within a matter of six weeks after the storm, we had had over 27 uh, legal clinics. Think about information fairs where you have multiple people there, including pro bono attorneys and our staff and local bar associations that we worked with uh, ready to provide information to individuals that are in the process of applying uh, for FEMA assistance. In Miami-Dade, our office, um, thankfully, as Chief Justice uh, referenced, Miami-Dade was not as impacted with the strength of wind that was anticipated, thankfully. Uh, but our office was actually without power for two weeks for a variety of reasons. But what we were able to do is within days after the storm, we had a somebody donate their boardroom and our office, our staff went with laptops and thankfully we're very, you know, have online intake and we're cloud-based and with cell phones now we started doing intake and helping people and also doing those same uh, legal clinics in Miami-Dade. I think uh, we had seen almost a thousand, close to a thousand people in providing that information. And again, this was not just our staff, I want to make the point, we make every effort to reach out to um, local community agencies and local bar associations, and we had pro bono attorneys working with us. And so we approached, it was sort of far and wide, we worked with everybody from a local hospital health system that after the storm was going out and providing primary care using a health van, to a medical school that was doing the same, um, and then obviously a lot of social service agencies that are pretty uh, close to the community and work with them on a regular basis and our elected officials. So we took the approach that if you, you know, before the storm, we sort of put out feelers saying, you know, we know this is gonna be an issue, so uh, we wanna partner with you afterwards just immediately to get the information out. And we found that that was very helpful um, in sort of getting the word out and getting the right information to these individuals because it can be very complicated. And we found that people that aren't usually our clients that were sort of just getting by with either limited income if they're elderly, um, or fixed incomes, I should say, or limited income if they're working poor, which 42% of our clients are. Um, they all of a sudden now are our clients because they are hit with this crisis and they don't have that you know, room, uh, that buffer. If you're living with limited income and you have to prepare for a storm, there goes your reserves. And so anything after that uh, is gonna be basically a crisis. And so we work to, to minimize that or avoid it to the extent that we can. Monica, how did, how? how did you deal with the problem of distance? Uh, your main office is in Miami. Uh, the Keys are a, a long way from Miami. Um, how were you able to um, physically access the people who were most in need of your services in the Keys? So as I sit here right now, we have a staff in three different, well, over the next couple of days, they'll be in three different sites in the Florida Keys working with law students that are on spring break. And so the answer is just that we go down there, but but it's not helpful to go down and say, okay, we're here, we're setting up a, an in, in, intake site and nobody shows up because why would you know? The, the key is to sort of have those relationships in place beforehand so that places where people congregate sort of naturally after 
either a storm or even you know months after the storm how we are now, but that they still go to for help, that we're part of that system. And so even if that individual doesn't self-identify as having a legal issue, because sometimes people that are denied FEMA assistance, that's a classic legal case, may not even think that an attorney would be helpful because for a FEMA appeal, you're not going, initially at least, you're not going to court. So that's where people think I need an attorney. Um, and so, but there is legal rights that attach to that and you can have an attorney help you. And so we work with social service agencies um, and uh, like I said, government officials, anybody that will sort of work with us, we train their staff on the, the wide array of services that we provide so that they know to refer individuals. And then also we teach them how to go. We have an online intake system, which is very helpful. Uh, so if you're sitting in you know, a United Way partner in the Florida Keys and you're telling that case manager you have a legal issue, instead of saying, oh, you should call them, they're just doing the online intake with the client as they're in their office. So now it's on us and we're reaching out to the individual. So partnerships are key and we partner with anybody that'll have us. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask uh, Sandra and Monica to say something about um, the impact of hurricanes on the people who are providing the service, uh, the legal aid lawyers and your staffs. Um, legal aid lawyers as a group are the lowest paid lawyers in the legal profession. <coughs> the average starting salary for a legal aid lawyer last year was about $48,000. Uh, I think these people are heroes. These are people who make real our nation's solemn pledge of justice for all to folks to whom that might otherwise just be a cruel illusion. The, the services, what, you, what you've heard uh, Sandra and Monica describe are services being provided by people who themselves were affected by the storm but who put the interests and needs of others above their own. Uh, can you say something about how your uh, recent storms affected the people who work in your offices and how they were able to serve others when they had their own problems to deal with? Sure. Um, so I told Jim a sort of a joke. I live on Bray's Bayou. My house has flooded four times in three years. It's now up in the air. I got five feet, two inches of water. I didn't miss a day's work in the beginning, and I'm not alone. 20 of us in our Houston office flooded. Um, my paralegal Graham, his house got over a foot of water. We all kept showing up for work. Um, we scrambled, and I tell people I'm always proud of us after every disaster, but I don't think I've ever been as proud of us as I was after Harvey. Um, the building blew up, nobody stopped working. 20 of us were flooded. We're still volunteering to go to the shelters, the disaster recovery centers. We don't miss a beat because people need us. After a disaster, it's not just the disaster team that responds, it's absolutely everybody. People will volunteer to come in outside from field offices to help relieve some of the people in the Houston office that have been staffing over and over again. Um, so I remember the two weeks before um, Thanksgiving, I was down to 68 hours a week, and I couldn't tell you what I'd been working before, but it was over that. And I'm not alone. I'm just typical of who works for legal aid. Thank you. Monica? Well, in Miami-Dade, as I said, our office was without power for a couple of weeks, and that was sort of emblematic of what was emblematic of what was happening in Miami Dade in terms of the the slow return to power and we had staff that were not only without electricity which is an inconvenience to some but in some instances if you have elderly parents with health issues that you're caretaker for or you have uh, smaller kids it becomes really uh, difficult and we had staff that were working I would say we had one attorney that was I think the morning after the storm she had she had a client who was obviously already a client before the storm hit, and it was an elderly public housing building, and they had some serious conditions issues, and they had all these residents that were elderly in the parking lot and weren't being allowed in, and she got a call the morning after the storm on her cell phone and was down there trying to figure out how to help people. And you know she has a child herself and was dealing with all these same issues. Uh, so our staff, and, and similar to Sandra, I mean, I, I, like I said, I think what happened in Texas was widespread. 
uh, much more than would happen in, in, in South Florida. But the, um, the, the level of that clients, I'm sorry, that attorneys were working, and honestly, just staff as well, for days straight, I want to say it was at least two weeks that people were working straight uh, weekends and working through, even though maybe you know friends and family weren't returning to work yet because businesses were closed, our clients needed the assistance and they were getting out into the community. So I, I, I think it's, it's inspiring to see when people care so much about helping their community and having an impact and knowing that a crisis for themselves is a problem, but that thankfully, you know, even though you know, we're not the highest paid attorneys, we have the sufficient resources to deal with this crisis. We know that our clients, if we're not there, are gonna be much worse off than if we're there. And, and, our, and our attorneys know that, and it's, it's great to see that in action. Thank you, Monica. We have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions for any? Yes. <laughs> So the, the question is about uh, contract interpretation issues that arise in insurance uh, policies after a storm where you'll find that the um, insurance company is uh, taking a very narrow view of what the policy covers. Um, and uh, guess what? Your problem is not covered. Are those the kind of cases that you get involved in? Um, so yes, I mean, clients could come to our office and we would see if there's anything that obviously that we could help them with. And in instances where we can get them pro bono representation, we're doing that as well. That's an area of uh, insurance coverage claims where pro bono lawyers, lawyers in private practice can be particularly helpful because often they're dealing with those kinds of issues in their day-to-day -day practice for clients who can't afford to pay. Whereas there are other kinds of work like specialized FEMA work, for example, where you'll, you'll need to do training for those lawyers. That's not what they typically do day-to-day. -day. So that's a, there, there's always a very um, a strategic decision to be made about how you're going to deploy your volunteer pro bono lawyers and try to find a good match between what their skill set is and what the needs of your clients are. Other questions? Yes. Uh, the question is about uh, what might be done to simplify FEMA processes so that people don't need a lawyer uh, to make the processes more friendly to people who, who, uh, who don't have counsel. Um, clearer and more definitions. They recently issued a unified guidance on the individual and households program, but unfortunately um, some of our attorneys working cases have had discussions with FEMA employees where they have apparently reinterpreted or made their own interpretations of things. So if everything was transparent and open and defined and training materials were given freely, all the legal aid attorneys in the country would be very, very happy. I, oh, sorry, I just wanted yes, to add one ahead. thing. One of the most common denials that we've seen, and again, it may be the nature of the work in the Florida Keys right now, is a lot of the denials are in mobile home parks. It's very common for individuals not to, it's ownership and not list their lot number. And we've had a lot of denials because uh, FEMA is saying, well, that household already got assistance, but everybody's putting the address of the mobile home park. And so, um, you know, and if you have 30 coming in from the same address, maybe looking the type of housing it is, and, you know, they need to list a lot number, but those sorts of things, uh, if they make it to our office, great, we could work that out pretty quickly, but I'm thinking of the ones that don't, and if you want to avoid needing an attorney or an appeal at all. Aloysius. Uh, 
the, the question is whether uh, members of Congress and whether legal aid organizations work with members of Congress and their staffs, particularly caseworkers located uh, in the in the district, to deal with the kinds of issues that we've heard mentioned. Um, yes, they are referred to our office, and if they're eligible for legal aid services, that is one avenue of clients that we receive. So I personally know we have done that in the past, and also we work with our elected officials. Um, we're asked. Um, many times to come do a clinic that they're sponsoring. Uh, we do super neighborhood <laughs> clinics in Houston. So yes, our political representatives are one way that we do reach the community and that they're also referred to us. Yes, both state and federal. Yes. Monica? Yes, I mean, we do as well. We do a lot of work before uh, storms to make sure that they know about our services. And the, I think the first clinic we had in the Florida Keys what might have been sponsored by Sen uh, Senators Rubio and Nelson. So uh, we absolutely do work with them. And like I said, people naturally go to their elected officials for these sort of assistance with these issues. So it's a great source of clients for us. Hmm. And we, we um, provide members of Congress uh, with directories of legal aid providers uh, in not only in their areas, but in the state so that, and we encourage them anytime you have somebody call up like that, just get the directory out and refer them uh, to uh, somebody that can help. So uh, we're out of time now, but just to sum up, uh, you heard something about the importance of civil legal aid following a disaster, about the keen interest of the judiciary and in, in being helpful in ensuring that justice is available to people who can't afford a lawyer. You've heard about the extensive coordination that legal aid providers do with other uh, providers, other social services providers, disaster uh, agencies. Uh, we, we haven't talked about the Red Cross, but uh, legal aid organizations are well integrated, not only with FEMA, but with the American Red Cross and other service providers. And I hope you got a sense of the competence and the professionalism and the passion that legal aid lawyers bring to the work they do for people who have um, had very difficult experiences with disasters. Would you please join me in thanking our panelists?